well, 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 well. So the cat is out of the bag. John Dramani Mahama has selected uh, Professor Jenan Opokwajiman once again to be uh, his running mate for election 2024. Good news, good news. Okay, so what's, the, what's left? It's the analysis, isn't it? Once we have the story, we do the analysis. Good evening, viewers, and welcome to the show. Tonight, we're going to go on a touch screen to welcome Jenan Opokwajiman to the 2024 political election campaign and um, we'll, we'll look at what it means on the touch screen right now because we're going to start by uh, reminding Jena Nopokwajiman of a question I asked her in 2020 about her religious affiliation. Uh, once the announcement came, people have been sending me that video that you ask her a question about her religious affiliation, all of our candidates. And uh, I'll show you the video of, of my questions to Professor Nanopokwajiman uh, in 2020. We'd we'll also go to the touch screen and find out uh, who could it have been and... Um, how would it look like if it was another person? We're going to look at three candidates that were also in the reckoning for this, but eventually President Mahama stuck to the um, old Jay Nano Pukwajiman from the 2020 election. We're going to look at the prospect of President Mahama having selected uh, COP Kofi Boachi, for instance. We're going to discuss that. We're going to look at President Mahama having selected, say, Toby Afede, and we're going to look at President Mahama having selected Kwame Wadaku. The selection of Jenan Opokwa for the 2024 elections also means that the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, have had a fancy on their ticket uh, since the inception of Fourth Republican Democracy. We'll look at that uh, big, uh, bit, bit, bit as well. And then we'll go back to Professor Kwame Ahoy's book in which he talks about running mate selections and selection of campaign teams in historical NDC. That will conclude our conversation about Jenan Opokwa And then we shall welcome her to the campaign. I'm sure she's going to be outdoored maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, and she's going to have a lot to say when she's outdoored, and then we can interrogate those facts as the campaign uh, begins in earnest. Also, um, we, we have a story from Parliament from the sessional address last Tuesday. President Akufuado, at some point in a sessional address, uh, indicated to his audience, which was all the members of parliament, the speaker, and indeed uh, the entire population of Ghana, home and abroad, who were watching by live stream or by television. He made an indication about water. He said, everyone knows that I do not drink alcohol. And then he sipped the water again. We're going to tell you a little bit of a story behind uh, why the president said that, uh, uh, as we have been told yesterday. Very interesting story. We'll get there also. Now, uh, this... Uh, uh, at the session address as well, President Akufado talked about the savings that the Attorney General had occasioned to the government purse. Yesterday, we were one of those media houses who thronged the office of the Attorney General to find out whether indeed he has. This morning, the Daily Graphic led a story on part of the evidence, uh, showing the evidence of what the President said as part of the Attorney General's press conference held in his office yesterday in the afternoon. And uh, I have to congratulate Ghanaian journalists, who all of whom, as soon as the President spoke, uh, decided to go to the attorney general for verification. It was quite an interesting scene when we all met at the attorney general's office. We had a nice chit chat. Uh, the attorney general didn't give us uh, uh, refreshments. Maybe he should have. Uh, but otherwise, we had a very nice time talking to him and understanding the way he does his work. It was a great time. We'll show you some of the behind the scenes videos on that one as well. And then, Parliament has done the do, as some people say it. Or have they done the coup de grace, as others see it? Yesterday, an announcement came that after the third reading of the LGBT bill, Parliament has actually passed it. What this means is that the bill is now headed to the presidential desk at the Jubilee House for H.E. Danado Danko Akufado to accent to the bill, and it becomes law. When it becomes law, what does it mean? What does it entail when this, law, when this bill becomes law? Why are some people against it, and why are we able to announce this evening that we should not be surprised at all if by tomorrow morning or sometime early next week a writ is filed at the Supreme Court seeking certain declarations against the bill and perhaps also looking for a restraining order preventing the president from accepting to the bill. We're going to do all that on the touch screen. And we'll have a mini conversation in the studio about how young people see the bill. What are the pros and cons of the bill? Those who are against the bill in its form, why are they saying that? Professor Audrey Gajepo was one of the first to speak. And she said that the bill having been passed is equivalent to the restoration or the return of the criminal libel law. We're going to look at the aspects of the bill and, and viewers can then understand uh, why some people are saying what they are saying. All in all, the bill is supposed to say that Ghana does not support LGBT. The small conversations about it is the manner in which the bill is crafted. Uh, one of them, for instance, is that somebody was telling me this afternoon we're having a conversation that you know that uh, Bob Risky, I said, who is Bob Risky, the Nigerian guy? 
said, yes, is there a guy or a girl? How do you say? Okay, the lady, Bob Risky. So, uh, Bob Risky, the lady comes to Ghana for whatever reason. And then uh, I want to interview uh, him or her. How I say it, I don't know. I want to interview him, uh, former him, but he's a her. I want to interview her. And then we set up an interview situation in whatever hotel he's staying or we bring her here and we interview her. I will go to jail for two years for interviewing Bob Risky because he's transgender. I'm not supposed to, under the bill that has been passed, to be interviewing transgender people because that is seen by the bill as promoting the LGBT. Oh, we have uh, a CNN famous journalist Anderson Cooper arrives in Ghana, and I'm going to interview Anderson Cooper about his work at CNN. And then as we talk about his work at CNN, I'm going to ask him, for instance, that why is CNN focused against the, the, the Republican Party and especially against Donald Trump? CNN broadcast four years of content against Donald Trump when he was president and marshaled uh, American citizens to vote against him. Why that? That question is allowed if I'm asking Anderson Cooper. Then I move into another question. I said, Mr. Cooper, you declared recently that you are gay. How is your gay family doing? How is your husband doing, etc., etc.? I will go to jail for two years for asking Anderson Cooper those questions. Now, so that's what we're going to be discussing uh, later uh, tonight. If you don't mind my taking a commercial break now so that when we get on the highway and uh, nothing stops us, we have Jenna Nopokwajiman's story coming. We have uh, the Atua Ahoy history recollection of NDC running mates. We have um, presidents sipping water uh, and saying that he drinks only water. The story behind that. And then we have the Attorney General saving government money. And finally, we have the LGBT conversation. All of this is on Good Evening Ghana. Let's get ourselves ready uh, by taking a short commercial break. Right now, we'll be back in the studio for this very special Thursday edition. I'll be right back. Welcome to the show and uh, congratulations to Professor Jane Nano Pukwajiman. She's been renominated as the presidential running mate for John Dramani Mahama. Such an exciting moment for all of us news reporters as we get into the campaign fever and get into the campaign main gear. Eventually we'll get to the home stretch and uh, there'll be some stumbles, there'll be some pitfalls. People are going to say some things that they shouldn't say. It's going to be the horrible part. But it's also going to be the beautiful part. There's going to be music. There's going to be advertising. There's going to be contests. There probably will be a debate and et cetera, et cetera. All that enhancing Ghana's democratic reach uh, across the world and on its citizens as well. Congratulations, Jena Nopokwa Jiman. But uh, we begin the analysis tonight with the questions that I put to Jena Nopokwa Jiman in 2020. I just asked her, um, what is her religious affiliation because you know that in ghana um, we are either mohammedan that is muslim we are also christian which is itself divided into a few categories you have charismatic you have um, evangelical if you like and uh, you have pentecostal and orthodox and then you also have african traditional religion uh, the reason why i put the question to the honorable jenna nopokwajiman was that i saw a, a video where she appeared to be pouring libation or something like that and so this is the question I put to her. This is a four-year-old question from Good Evening Ghana in 2020. Have a look. Here in this photograph, uh, when the Professor Jenana Opokwajiman, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman, uh, there you see in the photograph, uh, she's in the center of the photograph, and she seems to have a snap bottle in her hand, and she is doing uh, obeisance to traditional religion. Uh, pouring libation is one of the forms of worship in traditional religion. It is recognized by traditional religion authors that it is the way that you talk to Onyankopon, the God, and so they, they pour libation and talk about Onyankopon Kwame, and it's a way to uh, dedicate stuff to, to God and um, uh, dedicate prayers to God and begin events and begin worship. Uh, there, there it is. Professor Nana Pokwajiman has the snap in her hand and she is delivering the libation herself. Uh, so I thought that um, maybe this was at the Emintimazi Palace and it is actually in Cape Coast. That's uh, Professor Nana Pokwajiman in the beautiful Kaba and pouring libation. So I thought one question to her would have been what religion does she subscribe to? Generally, as I said, if you're Ghanaian, you're either Muslim, you're Christian, or you're a traditional worshiper. That question didn't, didn't come and uh, maybe. Next time, the question should come. Whenever she calls a press conference, I'll send a reporter to ask that question because we have to know what religion uh, uh, presidential running mate, potential vice president uh, is. Okay, welcome back to the show. And uh, I, 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 I've seen the video, so 
what I'm saying today, I, you can tell that I said the same thing four years ago. Uh, that was, uh, that, that was then when Jenano Pokwajima was first nominated. Tonight, though, we're going to begin, uh, begin the analysis. It's before we look at her strength and her weaknesses, we're going to begin the analysis by, uh, looking at what else Professor, uh, John Dramani Mahama could have done. Where else could he, she, he have gone, uh, to demonstrate that, to, to select the running mate? So we begin, for instance, with Nathan Kofi Boache. If John Mahama had selected Nathan Kofi Boache, and I, I'd like to reiterate the position of that small book I talked about, the American journalist wrote a book entitled, was talking about American politics and politics of electioneering, and the book is entitled, If It Had Gone the Other Way. And he writes, it's a very interesting book that you should get. I just can't remember the author. I'll get it one day and I'll show you here. Uh, he talks about if the election had gone the other way. So, for instance, he picks a maybe 1984 election, the one that was won by Reagan, or especially he picks 1988. That was between uh, uh, Bush and uh, Dukakis for the Democratic Party. And he says, if the election had gone Dukakis' way, this person would have been national security advisor. This person would have been minister for finance, the treasury in America. This person would have been that. Then he picks another election in the United Kingdom, say 1997, and said, if the election had gone the other way, very, very interesting, interesting book to read. So that's what I'm going to do now in the next 10 minutes. If John Mahama had selected Kofi Boachi, Nathan Kofi Boachi, what would have been the strength, advantages, and the uh, perhaps the disadvantages as well. So Nathan Kofi Boache is a, um, is a, uh, a COP, Commissioner of Police, who could have been IGP. He's retired right now and he's thought to be a very good policeman, but he also has controversies. Now, if President Mahama had announced today that Nathan Kofi Boache was his running mate, the first thing he would have achieved, which he may not achieve with General Nopokwajiman, is the sensationalism of the announcement. Sensation. Kofi Bwache would have immediately brought some sensationalism to the, to the presidential ticket of John Muhammad just, just for today, just by the announcement. Now he says, Jenano Pukwajiman, and you can look at all media houses. It's not, it's not sensational. It's not, it's not turning anything as it did in 2020 because she was the first woman and people didn't know this has widely been expected. So the question you ask yourself is if you're a presidential candidate, particularly for the opposition party, every announcement that you make must carry a certain oomph, must carry a certain sensation and must carry a certain aura. It doesn't mean that when you, once you don't do that, the candidate is not a good candidate. No, we're just analyzing what a Kofi Boachi announcement today would have meant if, if, if President Mahama would have announced that Nathan Kofi Boache is my running mate today, it would have created a lot of sensation in the media. It would have created a lot of conversation among Ghanaians. And that conversation would be talking about the NDC ticket, talking about his prospects. People would have begun to look at Kofi Boache in the way in which he's going to manage the campaign. Kofi Boache as vice president, what is he going to do? Uh, people who like police will think something is going to happen. People who look at it differently. All sorts of angles. And then there will be a big tribal angle as well. Kofi Boache is a, an integral part of the Ashanti em Empire, if you like. And he has a very good relationship with the uh, Ashanti Hine, the overlord of Ashanti. Because Kofi Boache was also the regional commander of Ashanti region in 2016's elections. So if you name Kofi Boache, these are the things that are going to occur. However, what are the disadvantages? Disadvantages people are going to say that Kofi Boache had difficulties with the police with the drug issues in the 2008 stagor and all of that those are things that his opponents will bring up but in terms of the regional distribution the regional demographics the mpp are focusing on being able to secure their territory in ashanti and probably increase it you know that the mpp decreased its uh, votes in ashanti in the last election between 16 and uh, 20 in 2020, in 16, the MPP was doing 76% of the total number of votes valid in Ashanti. They won 76% of it. In 2020, the MPP won 70%. Uh, so six percentage points lost. The NDC is hoping that they can eat further into that, uh, into the Ashanti situation. For the NDC to do well nationally, looking at the numbers, they always need to win between 28 and 35% of votes in Ashanti. If they can do 35%, that's really significant. Uh, 28 is okay. So the Kofi Boache angle would have been one of those that would be used to bring on young Ashanti people who are either disenchanted with the MPP, something like that. The votes that Kofi Boache can get for the NDC in Ashanti, Jena no Pokwajiman cannot uh, get it for them in Ashanti. The votes that Kofi Boache, they are, they are complete different contrast. The votes that Kofi Boache will get in Accra among young people, especially young male people, uh, and also to energize the campaign, get them to, to talk about the campaign. Kofi Bwachi is going to be on radio and television speaking for John Muhammad's uh, ticket. That would have been huge 
I have to say, in terms of media, I don't know whether that is going to convert to votes or not, but in terms of the media appearance and the media engagement and the media platform, platforms that Kofi Bwachi was going to appear on, that was going to be significant, very, very significant. It was going to take the NDC campaign into another level, so long as media is concerned. As I keep saying, whether that will translate into votes in the ballot box, I don't know. But in terms of our analysis, this is what would have happened if uh, Kofi Bwachi was the candidate uh, for the NDC. The other point uh, that will downside for Kofi Bwache's candidate would be that he's not an old, real member of the NDC. He's not a party person as such. He's friends with John Mahama, that is true. He has friends both ways, but he's not being seen as a party person. And John Mahama is, 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 a, is going to be, if he wins, he's going to be a one-term president. So immediately he selects a running mate that the, the thinking about, is he thinking about the inheritance? Is he thinking about the future? Would Kofi Bwachi be able to hold the storm, hold the weather together uh, two years into the government if John Mahama were to be elected? He as vice president then, would he be able to hold it together when the party, the NDC party, will be looking for a new leader? Is he prepared to put himself in? Will other people in the N NDC be happy that Kofi Bwachi has come in straight to the top as vice president and now he's pushing to be the leader of a party that he didn't help build, to be leader of a party that he's not an integral part of, to be leader of the party that he hasn't, that, 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 that. all of those arguments were going to go through President Mohammed's mind if he was thinking about Kofi Bwachi. But that's part of the downside. But the upside, this announcement of Nathan Kofi Bwachi, if it had happened, would have created significant sensation. Let's go to the next uh, candidate, Togbi Afede. Now, Togbi Afede uh, was, was talked about at some point two weeks ago or so to be uh, John Mohammed's running mate. What would have been the ad advantages that Togbi Afede will bring? Uh, let's look at the advantages before we look at the demerits. The advantages Togbi Afede will bring will be the economic conversation. You know, uh, the, up till now, as Tony Edu of the NDC said, up till now, the NDC have not been able to really find a replacement or a match for Dr. Baumia in terms of his articulation of economics. You can say that he's a liar, something, something, whatever. But in terms of Dr. Baumia's presentation and his articulation of the economic situation, the economic policy, the economic um, um, algorithms of Ghana, how it works and what should be done and all of that. The NDC have not been able to find any person in their party that has that kind of understanding and be able to articulate it. They may have the understanding, but they surely have not been able to articulate it. Case okay, Talatu Forsen, minority leader, is supposed to have a PhD, but he certainly doesn't articulate like Dr. Baumia does. Togbe Afede would have presented an answer to that because he certainly knows a lot about, about that situation. He's been on the board of Bank of Ghana, and he's been a private sector operator. He's been part of all the borrowing that Ministry of Finance has been doing. His company, SAS, has been part of those borrowings. So he understands, he has a bird's eye view of the situation. He would have been able to com campaign on the economic situation and convince people that he knows what he's talking about, he knows what he's doing, and what the MPP is doing is wrong. He would have been able to say that. If Togbe Afede says that people are perhaps going to believe it a little bit more than Jenan Opokwajima, what Togbe Afede will give you in an economic presentation, economic analysis, Jenan Opokwajima will never give you that. Togbe Afede's downside is that he probably may not have political footprints. You know, he's not a politician like that. He's He's a football politician in Hearts of Folk, yes. But in terms of political footprints across the country, he certainly doesn't have it. And then you're going to ask yourself, where is his constituency? Who people are going to vote for him? His main constituency, in terms of uh, the elections that we've seen for a long time, is going to be the Volta region. Toby is a proud son of the Volta region, and he's also the chief there. If he had been nominated, he would have had to abdicate. The Volta region is where you can determine that Toby is going to have a world ban. But the question will be, why must the NDC select somebody for votes in the Volta region? Don't they already have Volta region votes? Yes, they do. The NDC already has Volta region votes. But the question is always asked. The MPP always have Ashanti region votes, but they always select people from Ashanti. Now that they've selected a northern uh, presidential candidate, the party is almost resolved on the basis that they are going to select a, a running mate from Ashanti. But they do certainly have the Ashanti votes already. But why are they always going for candidates there? So that argument has come in, in the NDC circles back and forth. Why don't you take a Voltarian? And they say, but we already have the Volta votes. J.J. Rollins has settled it for us. And then they say, well, but the MPP still go back to Ashanti. So that's the group of people who were thinking that you have to put Togbe Afede in the saddle. So Togbe would have gotten the Volta votes. But does the NDC need Volta votes? Perhaps not. Come to the middle class, Togbe would have been able to articulate the position of the middle class. Would he have been preferred to Baumia? I don't know. You have to look at the presentation of both. We, when I look at Dr. Baumia's presentation and people who look at his presentation, you cannot but fall in love with him. You can decide 
what you want about what the NDC says about him. But if you listen to Dr. Baumia doing a presentation, you cannot but fall in love with him. The guy is extremely articulate. He's very sensible. And he doesn't say, look at the campaign. Which, which loose talk can you present, Dr. Baumia have said? Which one? You haven't heard? If he started campaigning in 2008 and 2012, he's been speaking. You can't say that Dr. Baumia says something that is loose talk for the many years of his political campaigning. So when Dr. Baumia is articulating something, he's very convincing. Togwe Afede might be able to do a little bit of that, but I don't know whether he can match it, but people can decide. So if John Mahama are taking point at Togwe Afede, in terms of the sensation that I talked about Kofi Bwache, yes, there again, also, the sensation would have been available for Togwe Afede as well, but he didn't get the selection. Let's look at the, uh, let me first clean this out, and then let's look at the uh, next, the next individual, Kwame Wadaku. Okay. If the announcements had come today, in favor of Kwame Iwadaku. Between Iwadaku and Kofi Bwache, I think that he would have had the highest pitch of sensationalism, given his age and given his spread around, you know, the sensationalism, Iwadaku would have had the highest pitch of it. And it would have gained the NDC campaign some percentage points. His age as well, his connection with the youth, the fact that he was a parliamentary candidate and was able to mobilize students at the University of Ghana it was when he ran in parliament in, in 2012 or so that the NDC got the highest number of votes in the University of Ghana polling stations in Ayawaso West Wogod. It demonstrates that Mr. Wadako has a certain connection with the youth and he's able to mobilize it. And that would have set the campaign differently. If Iwadako had been made a running mate and he had decided that he's going into the universities in KNUST to organize a walk over there, that's his alma mater, by the way. He goes to Legon to organize a walk over there. That's where he campaigned to be parliamentary candidate. He goes to UDS. He's the kind of person that could have the magnetic attraction from students and young people to follow him and to work on the campaign. That's what Iwadako would have brought to John Mohammed's ticket. I think it would have been a very sensational ticket. And in terms of youth mobilization effectiveness, Iwadako may have been able to achieve that in a much bigger way. Uh, also, Iwadako comes from the Ashanti region. He is famously known uh, to come from uh, Jabin, where his father was a chief. So he is an integral part of Ashanti. And in terms of mobilizing to secure Ashanti votes away. So I'm thinking that Iwadako would have been a particularly very, very good and sensational ticket. So we move on to the next stanza of the conversation. To do that, let's break through with Jane Wanapokwajman's montage. Congratulations, madam. She is the NDC presidential running mate. All right, so the, there's another story about the NDC running mate. We're going to talk about it. What President Mahama has done today uh, also generates another narrative. It means that since 1992, when the uh, politics of the uh, Fourth Republic started, in every election since 1992, the NDC had had a fancy on the ticket. Every election, 92. Okay, let's start here. 1992 was a Konkens Sinaka, who is a fancy who was on the ticket as a running mate. Eventually, the relationship didn't end well, but yes, he was. Uh, who is next? Let's let's go to the next one. Uh, Professor J. A. Mills was on the ticket as a running mate, uh, vice president to J. J. Rollins in 1996. Let's move on to the 2000 election. Professor Mills was now the candidate of the NDC in the 2000 election. So he was the fancy on the ticket and Martin Amidu was the uh, deputy on the ticket. Let's go to 2005. Professor Mills was retained again on the ticket. So he's a fancy and uh, he was on the 2005 ticket. And then in 2008 for 2009, Professor Mills was the presidential candidate. And then came 2012 where Pakwisi Misata, the former governor of the Central Bank, the former deputy minister of finance, and economic planning was now made the running mate to John Dramani Mahama. And then came, that was repeated. Now, that was repeated in 2016, I believe. Pakwisi Misata was repeated in 2016. So that was another fancy on the ticket. And then you come to 2020's elections. Jena Nopo Kwajiman, also the fancy, uh, also repeated over here. And then uh, next after that is, um, next after that is Jena Nopo Kwajiman as well for the election 2024. So there's always been an NDC on the uh, election ticket. So that's our story for uh, Professor uh, Jainano Pukwajiman. Uh, should we end with a montage or what should we end with? I believe that we have the Atua Hoy uh, book. So uh, here we're going to, uh, it's, it's a slightly different story. It's, it's, it's almost related to the uh, Jainano Pukwajiman story, but we just looked at the book and we thought there's some story in there that we can share with our viewers. Let's move on to the stories. Uh, <laughs> uh, the story is about the attempt, as Kwame Nahoy put it, the attempt by Flight Lieutenant Rawlings 
to get Professor Mills out of the NDC ticket for the election 2008. This is a story also about betrayal because as Kwame Nahoy puts it, J.J. Rawlings was asking friends of Professor Mills to betray him. Let's see what the story starts. It's, it's quite long, so if we don't finish, we'll continue next week But because we have other stories to deal with tonight. Okay, Professor Mills, he said, had not hidden the fact that he had been having health problems from the time that the 2004 elections ended. His condition had taken him to China, South Africa, and the USA for treatment. It was while he was in South Africa that rumors about his alleged terminal illness began to circulate, most of it attributed to Ecospio Gabra and some text messages he was alleged to have sent to President Rawlings after he had visited Professor Mills in South African hospital. President Rawlings also allegedly used his newfound friend, Herbert Mensah, a former chairman of Asante Kotoko Football Club, to spread the rumors even further that Professor Mills was too sick to contest the 2008 presidential election and that the NDC was looking for a replacement candidate. Some of Professor Mills' closest friends within the NDC also joined the rumor bandwagon with Spiogabra being touted as the likely replacement because he, of course, Spiogabra, had come second at the Legon and Block presidential primaries. It was rumored, however, that Spiogabra himself as uh, as being used as a decoy for a possible entry of Mrs. Rawlings into the race as Professor Mills' replacement. With hindsight, this view may not have been far-fetched, given that in 2011, Mrs. Rawlings was to challenge Professor Mills in the NDC presidential primaries when Professor Mills was the incumbent president. On one occasion, it was actually reported with great firmness in sections of the media that Professor Mills had died in a South African hospital. It took a hastily arranged interview with him by Radio Gold for the rumor to be dispelled. There were even rumors that the South African doctors had predicted that Mills would not live beyond that August 2008. The agenda to replace him, therefore, became more frantic with some Professor Mills' so-called closest friends working closely with President Rawlings and others to replace Professor Mills as the NDC presidential candidate. In that connection, President Rawlings tried to get Professor Mills to step down or be replaced as the NDC presidential candidate for the 2008 elections after he had been elected by the party in his 2006 Legon N Bloc Congress. The idea was for Ecospio Gabra to replace him, having placed second at the Legon N Bloc Congress. It was also widely rumored that it was indeed President Rawlings and his wife who had sponsored Ecospio Gabra and Eddie Annan to contest against Mills at the 2006 Legon N Bloc Congress. With regard to Ediana, I can confirm that it was not a rumor because I have personal knowledge of Rawlings' sponsorship, not financial anyway, of Eddie Annan to contest Professor Mills. Um, okay, do they want me to end here? Let me, let me do a last one, then I'll be wrapping up. In the run-up to the December 2006 Legon and Block Congress, Eddie Annan used to invite me, Kwame Nahoy, to breakfast with him at his residence near Togo Embassy on Saturday mornings. At one such breakfast meeting, Eddie mentioned to me that he had decided to contest the NDC presidential primaries against Professor Mills and wanted me to inform Professor Mills for him. I, Kwame Nahoy, was stunned. I said, Eddie, but Professor Mills is your very good friend. He comes to swim in your house every morning. Why do you want to contest him? His answer was, don't you know that Prof is not well? <laughs> okay, let's move on. I told him, this is Kwame Nahoy speaking to Eddie, he said, Eddie, you are a businessman, and so you don't take unnecessary risk. You know that nobody in the NDC knows you, apart from the small quartier of friends you have in the party, including myself. For you to decide to take this risk, you must have been up to it by a very high personality in the party. And looking at your association within the party, it is only Jerry Rawlings and his wife or both of them who could have convinced you to take such a risk and contest against your own very good friend because I believe you know your chances of winning are zero. Wow. That's, a, that's an interesting conversation. Eddie got angry and said that I had insulted him because in my answer, I was insinuating that he did not have a mind of his own. That was the end of the joint breakfast sessions between Eddie Annan and I. After that, he never invited me to his house again. I'll pause here and then we will continue the story. Remind me, viewers, remind me that Kwame Nahoy's story 
on the NDC selection of candidates will be continued. He goes on and on and on, and he ends up in the campaign team situation. Very, very interesting. So, yes, that's, uh, uh, that's the story of, uh, of, of Kwame Naho. Let's get to President Tasting Water and give our people uh, the story behind it at the, uh, at the uh, sessional address in Parliament. President Kufado uh, said something to his audience and uh, generated laughter and it's generated a bit of humor let's let's have a look at the video if it's ready and then uh, let's get to the story everybody who knows me knows i don't drink alcohol <laughs> everybody who knows me knows i don't drink alcohol Everybody who knows me knows that I don't drink alcohol. So how, why did uh, Dana Kufuado, the president of the republic, say that to parliamentarians? Was it in his speech? No, it wasn't in his speech. So during the session, and those, those who were there headed, those who, those who were in the chamber headed. So the guy, the, 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 the thing that they're pouring the water in is opaque. You know, it's not like this that you can see that it's water. It's like my, oh, it's not here today. It's like my flask. It's opaque. So um, they, somebody, they were pouring something into the opaque uh, container and he saved it and then one of the minority members i think two or three of them maybe shouted at him in like a bit of heckling you know how they do it in parliament shouted at him and said that what are you drinking mr president what is it that you are drinking what are you drinking so when the president spoke in response to that and then so he knew that the person was insinuating that he was drinking alcohol or something else uh, because he was in an opaque material and so the president said everyone who knows me knows that i don't drink alcohol and therefore, it is not alcohol in the opaque. It only can be water. That's, that's the story behind it. Members of parliament were discussing it when I arrived in parliament this morning. They were having a conversation about it. So I, I, what happened? Then they said, but is there any people who ask him that? What is he, what is he drinking? He wasn't being sarcastic. He wasn't casting aspersions on anyone. He wasn't insinuating anything. He was answering the question that came as a result of the heckling. But then these people said that, what are you drinking in the thing? He said, everyone knows I don't drink. Let's see the video again and then we can understand it better. Have a look at the video. Everybody who knows me knows I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, that's how uh, it goes. We've done, that's the end of that story as well. Now... Let's get to uh, the other big story. But before I do that, let me just invite text messages uh, to come in now on Professor Genano Pokwajiman and President says I don't drink alcohol. Uh, let me let people uh, uh, interact with the situation here. Later on, we're talking about LGBT as well. So uh, social media viewers are ready now. Uh, social media editors are ready now. Let's take the set of text messages that's coming on this one. Let's take the text messages. Okay, so let's dig into our text messages coming from Augustine Asari Donko. He says, my Thursday evening current affairs lectures is on with Prof. Paul Adumotri. No disturbances. Prof. Paul, take our school. Coming from Mohammed Nuruddin, he says, good evening, Paul and the team. John Mahama treating Prof. Nana is not a surprise. But what we want them to know is that the same Prof. during her tenure as an education minister couldn't provide Chalk to teachers. Just inform them that Dr. Baumia is coming. Also, coming from Baba Suleiman, he says, I like the counterfactual analysis, Paul. Coming from Kweku Opuni, he says, Paul, it seems like every corner of this upcoming election is going to be record breaking. Lastly, from Hamdan, he says, Apostle Paul, help me extend a heartfelt congratulations to Honorable. Haruna Idrisu, for JM picking Professor Nana, Professor Jane Nana, is a clear indication that the NDC is automatically suggesting that the next ticket of their party is Jane and Haruna after JM. And coming from our sponsor, Blue Jeans Energy Drink. Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been on the Ghanaian market for over 20 years. We already know what it does for the body. It contains vitamins and nutrients like vitamin B2, B3, B6, B12, as well as taurine and guarana. 
which are known to boost your strength and energy, as well as promote high performance and endurance. Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been tested and tried. It is indeed the best. Blue Jeans Energy Drink is for bold and active men and women. So go on, grab a cold can, and power your day. It is in shops nationwide. For bulk purchases, contact Budget Cash and Carry Limited on 0208 128 190, 0208 128 190 or 055-001-0000. What do you have to ask me? Okay, so Matthias Wameno says that the NDC has taken the people of the voter region for granted. The region is an NDC World Bank voting machine. If you query where are you, we would go to the northern part of the country and talk about Dr. Baumia. Now, our guest in Asari Donko says, is Mr. Mahama concerned about the future of the NDC or not? Per the constitution, Mr. Mahama is allowed only one term, which is four years. Whether he wins or loses, he has only one chance. Choosing Prof. Nana Opokwa Jeman, who is not well-known NDC politician, and her age, not well known as well, doesn't help the future of the party, which means that 2028 will have a challenging, will be a challenge if NPP maintain Dr. Baumia. Mr. Mahama is on his way to kill the NDC forever. Abdullah Mankarigu thinks that the NDC picking um, Nana Poku as the flag bearer, so as a running mate, he says um, the same players for him, the same coach, the same referee, and another mysterious defeat await the NDC. Now, Joe Boy says if Mahama fails in 2024, he will present himself in 2028 too. That is why he won't choose someone who can compete with him in the next NDC presidential primaries. Zygon Radford says the NDC keeps saying that the economy is in bad state, yet they are coming to this election with JM or Jane not understanding economics nor finance. How can such ticket do anything meaningful to revive the economy as they say? Now, Prince Ahmed Hamini thinks that John Mahama is gradually sabotaging the Voltarians and Freeman Atabili supports and says he has already sabotaged us already. Now, Kenny Kenjamin says John Mahama looks tired, confused and worn out. For the sake of the NDC winning more votes in the Ashanti region, they should have chosen a running mate from the Ashanti region. This is also another wrong choice and another defeat for the NDC. Now, lastly, Noah Man uh, Mankora says, My name is Nora, watching you from Kusiga in the north in the Nkwanza south of the OT region. Thanks for watching. What new, he asks, is the prof bringing to the economy? Now, from our sponsor, Almin Alternative Medical Hospital. Almin Alternative Medical Hospital is the first to modernize herbal and homeopathy medicine in Ghana with our trained and experienced medical practitioners from KNUSC combined with state-of-the-art medical equipment. Every hidden ailment will be diagnosed with ease and treatment given in no time. We offer consultation, counseling, physiotherapy, homeopathy to treat most ailments. Your life is precious, so secure a good health with Amen Alternative Medical Hospital. We are working hours at 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. from Monday to Saturday, and on Sundays we work from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Locate us at Clagon on the Lashibia Shaman Road near the Underbridge. Book an appointment with us on 0207-229. 505-0207-229-505 or 0244-227-192 0244-227-192 I'm in Alternative Medical Hospital God is the healer yeah, Angelo. Of course, God really is the healer We've got Chrissy Bartolona watching us from Mittal Camp saying I greet you Adom and your team Great evening to the most affable impactful Vice President Incoming President of Ghana Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya uh, I'll truncate this and move on. We've got the page called Youth for Baumia, perhaps attempting to troll the NDC. They say TOEFL school is duly open. We have calm skills uh, and English madam in charge, perhaps referring to the academic background of uh, the top candidates for the NDC. Perhaps they would want economics or legal people. Uh, Prince de Krenzel says, running mate, please, no mate... Uh, 
please, mate is no more relevant. We focus on the driver. Very interesting point trying to be made. Monday, Kojo again also tries to troll. He says, Napo, free SHS, perhaps tipping Napo as a pot potential running mate versus Prof. No Chalk, uh, attempting to make fun of Prof. Nana. Nah. Uh, Tom Too Sweet says, I think he's saying Dada and Kwa, she was Minister of Education who couldn't provide common chalk again now running as running mates are poo. Hey, well, that's, that's kind of harsh. And lastly, and on the conversation that we're going to be getting into later on in the show, we have Kojo Matasa Blair says, no president can assent to this bill in Ghana. There are more pressing and important issues to tackle as a nation. Well, to you, Paul. Oh, but before that, though, we've got... Oh, I almost forgot our friends over at Betway. They say, Chale, the season is getting hotter and the odds are getting sweeter. Don't be left out in the action. Uh, Betway Top Up is here to assist customers with easier deposit options. Please do look out for the top up icon at any Momo vendor near you and deposit cash into your Betway account. Visit betway.com.gh and click on Top Up or please just call us on 055 29 23771 to be a vendor now. Note that there are no charges, no charges or deposits. So if someone tries to charge you, so then the bet we said, no, we don't do that. So also, please know that you must bet the responsible way. No under 18. Uh, terms and conditions do apply, and this is regulated by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet way, as always, get way more. Now, back to you, Paul. Welcome back, and uh, thank you very much for your interest in the program. I like the text messages and the people's enthusiasm about it. So let's let's get on there with the stories, yeah? So two stories we have more to do, the Attorney General story and then the LGBT. That's a crucial one. Uh, you have to wait for that. It's going to be an interesting discussion in the studio when we discuss the LGBT matters. This is Gofredia Boadami, the Leonard Attorney General and Minister for Justice. During the session address on Tuesday, uh, His Excellency the President talked about him. Essentially, I see the president made a revelation that made people doubt the, the, what the president was saying. The president said that Godfrey Diabo Adame and his team at the office of the attorney general have saved the country significant sums of money. That was to be expected. But then when he mentioned the sum of money, it was wild. It was 10 trillion. What is 10 trillion? 10 trillion means 800 billion United States dollars. What is the size of Ghana's uh, GDP? 100 and something, 162 billion or something like that. How are we going to cough up 800 billion of taxpayers' money to pay a judgment debt, but we'll get you the details and get you an understanding of how these things work? First, though, let's listen to what the president said. The Attorney General has continued in a very effective manner the tradition under this administration of contesting every single litigation against the state and has avoided the numerous judgment debts that used to be given against the state. The office of the Attorney General, as a result, has saved the country over 10 trillion Ghana cities. All the evidence is there. I shall be performing a pleasant duty in a few weeks' time when I commission the law house, the 12-story office building, which will house the offices of the Attorney General and the Ministry, and finally bring to an end the age-old office accommodation problem. I must declare a personal interest in it, as the building was started when I was Attorney General in the government of President John Ajakum Kufo back in 2001. Mr. Speaker. Okay, so we're all waiting for the commission of that uh, law house project that he talked about. So you had the consternations in Parliament after the President mentioned the figure, 10 trillion. And uh, the, 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 they were asking the Attorney General, are you sure? Are you serious about it? I'm excited because of the attitude of Ghanaian journalists on this matter the day after. So you see this video will start showing. When we walked to the Attorney General's office, all the media were there, and everyone had come for the same mission. They had come to ask the Attorney General, when and how did you save the government of 10 trillion uh, Ghana cities? Something in the region of 800 billion 
United States dollars. So this is the Attorney General's office uh, the afternoon after the uh, the President's uh, conversation with uh, parliamentarians. Uh, this is the office of the Attorney General and the Minister of Justice. This is a building that they are leaving uh, to go into the new one that the President says is going to commission. So I got in there uh, later than my crew and it's all the journalists were seated everywhere. So I walked into the Attorney General's reception to uh, find out what is happening and then we went in the setup began uh, th this is the wall of the attorney general's office as Nanado Danko Akufuado there is Siobeda Samoa Papa Usuan Kuma near Yuku Eutu and others the attorney general then walked in later he had been in a meeting somewhere so the journalists had been waiting for him when he came to the office he was welcomed by his deputy the honorable Tuya Yeboa this is myself and CTFM's Richard Sky and uh, we're hanging out in the attorney general's office trying to put their questions together this is Kojo Yangson of Joy FM who got the first shot uh, of the interview with the Attorney General, uh, Tuya Yeboa arriving uh, to shake hands with Kojo Yangson and, uh, and and myself in the Attorney General's office, back to the walls, and there uh, you have a... Uh, that's the Attorney General's Director of Communication to my right. And so here is a setup. We're putting a setup together. Tuya Yeboah is very hands-on. He was helping us put the setup together, and uh, the Attorney General had the documents. And these are all the journalists were there, ready. Daily Guy, Daily Graphic, Ghanaian Times, Peace FM, UTV everyone was there and uh, that's uh, joy fm got the first shot did, did i say that so this is the the setup for joy fm to finish their interview and then all the other media had their, their turn with the attorney general i was having a conversation with richard sky who was in mask uh, we had a few jokes and chats around as i said the attorney general didn't give us the reception and the refreshments but uh, next time i'm sure he would so so <laughs> we, we enjoyed ourselves having the interaction with him but it's always great for democracy when journalists go to the minister to try and ascertain the fact i think Ghana's democracy is growing and this was this was a very classic example of it all the journalists showed up in the minister's office and they, there there is a document uh the attorney general shared the documents with all the journalists and there everyone looking looking at the documents this is the attorney general uh, when he granted uh, the interview to to uh, uh joe fm first this is Joe FM's Kojo Yangsen seated with the Attorney General in his office. This was the first shot. I'm sure that the, the video will be on Joy News and those of you look at it can see it. After that, other media houses then got their opportunity. Uh, the Attorney General had to be clear with all his documents. He put all together uh, to be sure that uh, all the scan was correct. We scanned it. Uh, and then here again, what's he doing here? He's sitting down for the, the Joy FM one, which was the, the first one. And after that, everyone else participated uh, so the in, the, in, in, the, in the interview the, to, to ask him questions. That's the Attorney General on, on the floor. So, all right, so that's the, that's the story. Uh, that's what happened at the Attorney General's office yesterday in the afternoon when all journalists uh, went there to try and go and see him. Now, um, let's pick uh, the, the, the main defense that he rendered. And he said that to the, in the Joy FM interview when he spoke to Kojo Yangson. He talked about the essence of uh, how much money he has saved. When you've heard that, we'll come back onto the touch screen and we'll show you the figures uh, thereof. And after that, uh, you can send your text messages and we can decide whether indeed 10 trillion could have been owed to anybody. But why was it so? This is Attorney General explaining the savings that he had made to the government to Joy FM's Kojo Yangson. The president grossly underestimated it. And it was actually my dream mm -hmm. because every minister has a responsibility of bringing to the president's attention the work that the minister has done and in presenting my report i deliberately understated the account just not to raise honest eyebrows and to be honest with sensational but if you if, if, if you go through if you go through if you go through if you go through 10 trillion is just arising in a single case if you go through the savings are actually over 14 billion 14, 14 trillion. trillion yes i can refer to this matter china jilin which the supreme court set aside only last year the judgment debt here, if you look at the figure here, originally, and then all the time, Ganashir was in the High Court of um, Justice, I think, in Kumasi or so. The transport minister actually came here and made a lot of noise about it because it affected his account and all. And we took it up and compared to situations where ministers and uh, the also administration would team up and, 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 and orchestrate and facilitate judgment debt. It says this amount of 352 billion. So that the figures are even dizzy, you can't even. 352 million Ghana cities. 352,664,144.41 pesos. And then an amount of almost $1 billion. 
988 million dollars 294,313. That is it. So almost a billion dollars plus 325 million Ghana mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court again in 2022, after 2023, yeah, in the conclusion, the application before the court that we have crushed the ruling given was expressly to set aside the Ghana order. And without prejudice, making the controversial setting aside order. And they granted the order crushing all these proceedings. And uh, interestingly, in this judgment, the court actually held that, as we contended, that the persons who had mounted the action even had no capacity whatsoever. And the identities could not be <coughs> made out. Um, a person who was a foreigner holding a poor fatally, which had not been uh, properly uh, notarized, and who had even died later on in the course of the trial, and therefore could not have given another poor fatally to another person to pursue the trial, was allegedly pursuing this matter. And the court said, no, our contention was right. And therefore, if they want to mount the claim, they must come and properly establish their authority. To date, they have not come forward. That was the Attorney General uh, speaking on the facts of, uh, he spoke to Joy FM in that interview, on the facts of the things that had been, uh, uh, the, the facts of the figures that the president had rendered. So this is one of the cases. And it's um, um, Africa Automobile. Uh, that's the big one. Ministry of Employment and, um, and Power and Development. That's, that's the big one. How much was, was saved in that one? So this is the 10 trillion. This is the company that was asking for um, uh, company that was asking for uh, I'm trying to shift it. It's not shifting. <laughs> oh, tap. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm old. Technology is defeating me. So I tapped the 10 escape. So this 10 trillion is the equivalent of 800 billion USD. That's the 10 trillion. It's the equivalent of 800 billion uh, USD. Okay. Let me stand here correctly. So there, there, there you see it, 800 billion USD. Now, how is Ghana government, and, and somebody said this is totally ridiculous from the president, how is Ghana government, whose GDP itself is less than 800 billion, is going to be able to pay an 800 million judgment debt? And that, that's, a, that's a reasonable question, isn't it? So the thing started from the Ministry of, the, the, the contract, under this contract, some people were contracted by the Ministry of, uh, uh, what is it, Ministry of Employment, to provide vehicles and motorbikes for the ministry to supply to Ghanaian workers where to get motorbikes and some buses for ministries to take them here and there so they cut down their public transport. Some kind of interesting arrangement like that. Not too bad, but that was the arrangement. And this was set out um, before Mr. Kufour became president, 1999, something like that. That's how far it goes. This was set out before Mr. Kufour became president. And then the contract didn't happen uh, because some chief director, people looked through the document and felt that something, something was not adding up. So the contract didn't happen. In between, the public procurement authority law was passed and all of those things. So it changed a few things. Then after eight years of waiting, the people, the contractors, the supposed contractors, those who were going to execute the contract, after eight years of waiting without claiming anything, and this is how typically judgment debts work, viewers. Typically, this is how judgment debts work. A contract is being concluded with the government in 1999. It doesn't happen. The, the people who are to supply, to execute the contract, don't make any claim in 2001. They don't make any claim in 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They don't make any claim. Then they show up in 2009. As soon as the people that were doing the contract in 1999 returned to power in 2009, they show up with a contract. That's the problem. Or that's the canker of the judgment debt. The canker of the judgment debt is what I'm describing. People enter into a, a contract with government to execute one thing or the other or to provide some service or the other. It doesn't happen. Government goes away. Other people come and look at the contract and say, this contract is not a good contract. We're not going to take it. They don't say anything. They don't make any claim. They don't write any letter. They don't complain. They wait until eight years. The people come to power. We'll deal with this contract in some more detail when we go. We'll show you the personalities who were involved. The personalities who were chief directors at the ministry, who also became high senior 
uh, officials of the Mills administration in 2009, who we believe were behind these kinds of uh, bogus claims. That's that we're going to show you that in, in, in our next show. We're just gathering the information properly so that we can come. We're going to mention names that we know what we are talking about because we think that such people who work in the, the government of the time the contract was being done and then come back as high profile people in the, in the next government eight years later, their friends come back and they claim they put it together and they say government owes us 10 trillion. So, how did the 10 trillion come about? So, what they did was that they added interest, compound interest. Principal plus interest, principal plus interest since 1999, year on year, principal plus interest, principal plus interest. So by the time Godfrey Diabo Adami became Attorney General, uh, they came to make the claim in 2009, ran through 2009 till 2012 after John Mahama, they're still making the claim. And then they now say they are claiming 10 trillion. Their lawyer is also a very well-known lawyer. The lawyer for this claim. We're going to talk about all that on Tuesday. Tuesday, we're going to bring back this contract and give you the details of what happened, what was said in court, what the judges said, what the Supreme Court said. We're going to tell you everything. And we're going to mention the lawyers who were making this claim against the government. So that's how it became 10 trillion. And that's the point the president was making. That if you people are going to have compound interest, compound interest, then I'll go to parliament and tell the Ghanaian people that in fact, after putting your compound interest together, you are claiming 800 billion, which is 105 times our GDP, that we owe you that money, we should pay you a group of people who said they, were, they, they had a contract to execute a service for government. That's the point. That's what they do. That's the canker. We'll talk about the canker of judgment debt. Uh, when we come to talk about this, then we'll name the names of the people involved. So this is it. 800 billion is what they wanted. What's the next, what's the next story? The next case is, uh, uh, let me just rub the 800 billion uh, from there. The next one is this. This one is um, the, the high court in Kumasi, the Ministry of Reda said, uh, uh, China, Beijing. This China, Beijing matter was a simple matter. They had um, been contracted by the Ministry of Roads. This is all under Akufado's government. They had been contracted by the Ministry of Roads to put cameras around Accra. Some of those of you see that Accra in Kumasi, you see some cameras on the road, white-looking cameras. Yes, that one. So they, they were contracted by the Ministry of Roads to put the cameras. Government reevaluated, same government, Akufado's government, reevaluated the contract and thought that it was, one, it was too high. And two, it should be domiciled than the Ministry of National Security, not the Ministry of Roads. Because this is security cameras they are putting across. It's not Ministry of Roads. Ministry of Roads are doing the road. Doing the road, they have to provide the basis for cameras to sit on the road. So they might have some cabling done, etc., etc. But the, 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 uh, the execution of the work and the purpose for the work is a national security matter. So it became a conflict between the Ministry of Roads and the Ministry of National Security. Roads had awarded it to one contractor. The Ministry of National Security wanted to award another contractor. So the Ministry of National Security proceeded to terminate the first one and to award a new one. And then they went to court. What were they claiming? They were claiming, um, this is the one. They were claiming 988 million United States dollars, almost a billion dollars. This is the claim they were making. The Attorney General goes to court and he falls that claim. And he's able to make arguments in an arbitration where the arbitration agrees with him that Ghana government is not going to pay 988 million. You must have an attorney general who thinks that as part of his responsibility, he should challenge the claims being made by people, whether it's Alfred Woyeme, whether it's Paula Dumochi, whether it's China, Beijing. He should be able to challenge it. And that's what has happened here. And that's why the president had to put it in a sectional address. This attorney general and his team have decided that claims against government are just, just going to be paid. They are not just going to be swallowed hook, line, and sinker. You come and say we owe government, then we swallow it hook, line, and sinker, and we pay you. No, we are going to debate it. We are going to challenge it the same way as he told Joel FM, as he would have done as a pra private practicing lawyer. He will challenge the claims made against his clients and be able to reduce as much as he can. Here he saved the government that much. So if the president of Ghana says that the attorney general has saved the government uh, 10 trillion and we all didn't understand it and we all rushed to the attorney general's office this is the reason uh, why he said that now you have seen the video let me conclude going back to the montage uh, this time i'm not going to speak over it i'm going to leave the uh, sound to be over it and let's enjoy it. this is what happened at the attorney general i'm, I'm showing this montage again um, uh, a paying tribute to the Ghanaian journalist who decided that they will not leave the story where the president said it they will go to the attorney general's office and ascertain it this is what happened yesterday and this is the story by the way so we just do straight mm -hmm. Oh, it is as a yeah. Oh, you are here. We see you. Hey, that is where we make that. Where my dog made me. Why not crazy? Let me go and ask you a question. I don't know. You are the one. Why? Where my best one? No, I don't know. Okay.
Thanks for that. He says, oh, but what is even the total economy of Ghana? I said, well, it has nothing to do with the total economy of, of the country. Say to your um, pronounced friends on radio, the person should take a writ out against you in defamation for 10 million Ghana for defamation. Will that person come and check whether you have 10 million Ghana So the point I'm making is that the severity of a claim against the government of Ghana has nothing to do with the economy of the country at all. And these huge yes. claims are all down to compound, compound interest, essentially, and all that. Yes, long term. Long term, good. Right. Thank you very much for coming. Take care. All right. <laughs> So that's what happened at the Attorney General's office uh, yesterday. Now, we will uh, go back to the text messages, and after that, we'll take a short commercial break. Uh, text messages are coming, and then, after the commercial break, we have the LGBT discussion. Parliament has now passed the law. Uh, so text messages first, and after that, the break, and then we deal with the LGBT discussion. If one you know, says NDC and judgment stepped, Wyoming in if I were, she says, if it had been in NDC tenure, it would have been jackpots. He says, if for nothing, Nana has done us a big favor by having an attorney general who's, who is able to save us from all these judgment steps. Apostle, may, maybe you should one day analyze Muhammad's attorney general and how much judgment steps he was able to save us from. Coming from Abubakar Muniru, he says, Apostle Paul, that's exciting to see the Attorney General. And lastly, from Gariba. Coming from Gariba, he says, Abubakar Muniru, sorry, God bless you more, Apostle Paul. What's your first, Antoinette? Okay, so on the story, still on the story of the Attorney General and the judgment that's. Um, Kweku Opuni says the Ghana media houses and journalists should be interested in the details of the judgment debt to uncover those behind it. Now, Philip Daco says judgment debt is indeed a canker, and we, we know how the name judgment debt became famous in this country. In fact, I am glad we have a vibrant attorney general who has the country at heart. I salute you, sir. Now, Adolf Kogner says the AG should organize a press conference and make these documents available. The public should have access to these documents so that we know people who are preaching virtue and practice vice. We cannot wait for next week. Now, NIBS has a message for us with the Future Ready Leadership Summit. The future is here. Where is the leadership? The maiden edition of the Future Ready Leadership Summit dubbed Reimagining Leadership in a World of Unrelenting Change with very inspiring speakers such as Sir Sam Jonah, Dr. George Ejekum Donko, Prof. Kweku Etuahene Jima, and many distinguished speakers built to speak on the day. The summit will come off on 13th March 2024 at the Moving Pig Ambassador Hotel at 8 a.m. For tickets of the event, kindly contact 026-734-9147. 026-734-9147 or 0244-202-949. 0244-202-949. Angelo. Okay, uh, we've got Kwabi Chief making a very, very bold statement. He says, now praise these great and famous men. Congratulations to the sponsors of the anti-gay bill. Kwabi, this is going to get you in trouble in some places. So. Anyway, uh, 
Ibn Ali Duyao says, Apostle Paul Adumotri understand it. The Attorney General is a solid guy. May God continue to protect him. Now, Aaron Babaku says the selection of a running mate is a critical decision for any political candidate, and the NDC flag bearer's choice will be closely watched and analyzed in the lead up to the election. The running mate has the potential to significantly impact the outcome of the campaign, and the success of the ticket will depend on the candidate's ability to choose a qualified, experienced, and compatible partner to help lead the party to victory. John Kwashi, watching us from a dental house, now says, uh, good evening, Paul and your team. God bless you. Paul, our president, Nanado, does not take alcohol, and that's why he always looks like a 40-year-old. Okay, a bit of glazing. <laughs> Yao Rekwa Mwafu says, hi, I'm seated, listening to my lecturer, Paul Adam, on current affairs, number one program on air. My regards to you, or our regards to you also, Yao Mureku. Thank you for watching. Uh, oh, I have something for you. It's from our friends at Lifts and Elevators Ghana. Enjoy the fruits of your labor, they say. But as humans, the problem is aging and physical infirmities will stand in the way of enjoying your mansions and homes that you work for. Uh, it often becomes challenging, if not impossible, to use our stairways day in, day out. But worry no more, because with portable American pneumatic vacuum elevators, PVEs, you're sure of unlimited enjoyment of your mansions and your homes. It's simple, simple to use. It's self-supported, an elevator for vertical movement of humans and goods at homes and offices. Now, the original comes in three custom-made models with wheelchair, wheelchair accessibility to choose from. Now, you might call it a luxury, but the truth is it's a necessary imperative for vertical mobility. Do not let aging or infirmity limit you. Get one for your easy vertical mobility at home or in the office. It's very, very affordable and can be installed within just three days with modifications done to your building. Visit Lifts and Elevators Ghana at Sakuma Ono for your solutions and free consultations. Now you can find us on 0200-535-515 or just email elevatorsgh at gmail.com. We're going for a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Now we're going to the biggest discussion uh, for yesterday and today. The Parliament of uh, the Eighth Parliament of the Fourth Republic yesterday, uh, not unexpected, but announced that they had conducted the third reading of the LGBT bill. You know, the bills in Parliament go through the first reading, which is the announcement of the bill, and then the second reading, there's a consideration stage. Thereafter, they have the third reading after the consideration. The question was put by the Speaker, and the bill was passed unanimously by the parliament. Now, the bill is on its way for presidential accent, but we are hearing that there may be court action against it. What we are going to do on the touch screen right now is to tell viewers, um, get viewers to understand everything um, about uh, uh, everything about the bill. That's what we're going to get viewers to understand now. Okay, these are not the key protagonists as such, but lawyer Moses Formoinen, happy birthday to you, brother Fo, as we used to call him when we were growing up. We, they, they called him Abeku. Uh, back in Burma camp, and uh, he's 10, 60 years old. Brother Fo has been a powerful advocate uh, in this society for all things good, especially sport and uh, 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 proper sexual behavior. Brother Fo, congratulations. Sam George has been a leader on this bill for a significant part of the journey of the bill. Congratulations for getting it passed, uh, Sam George, the member of parliament for Ningo Pram Pram for the NDC. Alexander Fenyon Markin, uh, through Spanner in the works of Sam George, the last time when uh, he called uh, for something, some process that delayed it. We speculate now that Afenio Makin and the people who think like him are headed for the Supreme Court uh, to organize a, an injunction of sorts or something, and we don't know what application they're going to send to the courts. Our responsibility tonight, as we always do, is to bring to you viewers the full conversation about this LGBT bill, left, right, center, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get to the conversation. What are the provisions of the bill that the opponents of the bill are finding problematic? Here they are. Uh, so the bill is entitled Human Sexual Rights and Family Values, Act 2024. Now, the application of the bill is, is one of the early conversations that the people like Professor Tichua Menu would have with this uh, bill. The bill, the application of the bill, uh, this bill applies to persons who hold themselves out as lesbian, gay, 
bisexual, transgender, transsexual, an ally, a pansexual, and um, a person of any other sexual orientation or in a sexual relationship that is contrary to sociocultural relationship between a male and a female, who is also and a person who is also involved in the promotion of propagation of advocacy for support or funding of LGBT. So this is a criminal uh, bill, a bill with criminal consequences, a bill whose violation carries criminal consequences. That's the kind of bill you have over here. Now, the, the constitutional lawyers and drafters are raising a first fundamental question about this provision, this particular one, VII, where it says the relationship, uh, uh, the, the, the bill is prohibition against any person with a sexual orientation or in a sexual relationship that is contrary to the social cultural relationship between a male and a female. Now, social cultural relationship between a male and a female, will it include uh, uh, two people, one male, one female, who are unmarried, but who are having a, a, who are conducting sexual activity among themselves? They are unmarried. That's what they call fornication. Now, uh, social cultural relationship between uh, woman and man, according to the social cultural, is they are not supposed to be engaged in that when they are unmarried. Now, given the circumstance, does that does this bill capture them as well? That's why the drafters are suggesting that this provision may have been tightened a little bit or should be tightened a little bit because you are prohibiting a, a crime, which you, which you are then calling an offense. So because it is a crime, it has to be clear. There should be no ambiguity about it. They suggest that social cultural relationship between a male and a female is not properly defined, even in section 19 of the bill, which is the interpretation clause. You know that every bill has an interpretation clause. Now, section 19 of the bill is the interpretation clause. And in the interpretation clause, it doesn't really clearly or at all define social cultural relationship between a male and a female. So that's the first problem that the drafters are looking at on this bill let's let's move on uh, to the next thing so c says that any person who provides or participates in the provision of sex or gender reassignment surgical procedure or any other procedure intended to create a sexual category other than the sexual category of a person assigned at birth except where the procedure is intended to correct a biological abnormality including intersex or so they are talking about when you are born, you are born as a woman or you are born as a man. And we have always fought the LGBT people who say that somebody is not a man or a woman. How is somebody not a man or is a woman? A human being is either a man or a woman. An animal is either male or female. A goat is male or female. There's no transgender. There's no transgender dog. There's no transgender anything. So, so human beings are male and female. The binary com conversation, isn't it? Now, we are getting concerned that people think somebody is born and is not a woman. Or is a woman, but he, all those arguments we believe are not correct. However, uh, it's put here in, in the bill and they are excluding, uh, operation surgical that has to be done at birth for correction. So th this is, this is okay. Then there is any person who engages in a sexual activity prohibited under this act. Okay. That's quite general. So yes, that's also okay. Then they are also prohibiting here prohibition of propaganda of promotion of and advocacy for activities prohibited under the act. So a person who, through a medium, technology like television, platform, uh, accounts, or any other means, produces, procures, markets, broadcasts, disseminates, publishes, or distributes, or uses an electronic device, the internet service, a film, or any other device capable of electronic storage or transmission to produce, procure, market, broadcast, disseminate, publish, or distribute, a material for purposes of promotion, promoting an activity prohibited under this act commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a term of imprisonment of not less than five years and not more than 10 years. This is where uh, some of us are going to be in trouble because I've been looking for the opportunity to interview the Nigerian uh, uh, male woman bob risky i've been looking for that opportunity i've told my friends in nigeria that I tell bob risky that there's somebody a news reporter in ghana who really wants to interview him and if they call me tomorrow and say when can you come to lagos and i said i'm coming or they tell me that are you going to be in ghana bob risky is coming to ghana and then if i go to lagos or bob risky comes to ghana he's staying at the labadi beach hotel i go there i said mr miss mr miss or mrs bob risky i want to interview you then i do the interview 
viewers, can you imagine one day you are waiting for Good Evening Ghana, I'll be sitting here uh, doing this touch and then some policemen will walk into the studio and they say, hey, stop, stop the program, let the handcuff then. They pull anchor for me, I'll be working like this. Why? Because I interviewed Bob Risky. Why? Because of the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Act 2024. Is that what it's supposed to be? Should that be? This is the point of Audrey Gajepo. That's Audrey Gajepo's problem. That's, that's Audrey Gajepo's concern. Should there be an amendment of this part so that something can happen? I don't know. Let's go with the analysis and then, and then you see where, where we get to. Also, this, this is there. The disbandment of LGBTQ plus group society association club or organization. 13 says any group, society, association, club or organization in existence before the coming into force of this act, whose purpose, whether partly or fully, overtly or covertly, is to promote, facilitate, support and sustain in any way an act prohibited under this act is disbanded. All organizations, could you be see organization in Takrade, something uh, LGBTQ something somewhere you're all disbanded you're not allowed to operate in the jurisdiction of Ghana uh, am I done with it okay so this is by and large the problematic parts if you like the problematic parts of the the bill now let's 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 clear the problem by showing you uh, the provisions of the 1992 constitution which we believe will be will be settling down in the Supreme Court for a discussion when the, the people who are going to file their writ do that. So we're going to go through a few constitutional provisions that sort of uh, balance out the bill. Either it, either it appears that the constitutional provisions may have been violated or it appears that the constitutional provisions support the bill. We're going to put it together and share with you quickly so that you can understand and follow our discussion. Later on, I'm going to have a panel discussion with myself, Apriku, and Mikhail Angelo, who will be looking at this in some detail around the table. Okay, so Article 2 of the Constitution of Ghana, enforcement of the Constitution. A person who alleges that an act, an enactment or anything contained or done under the authority or, or that of any other enactment or B, any act or omission of any person is inconsistent with or is in contravention of. So somebody who alleges that something is being done that is inconsistent with the Constitution or is in contravention of the Constitution may bring an action to the Supreme Court. So this is, how, this is what grounds people's uh, desire to go to the Supreme Court. This is what grounds the action. Article 2, it says that if you're a Ghanaian and you think that something is being done, it's, in, it's inconsistent with the Constitution or it's in contravention of it thereof. You can go to the Supreme Court and ask them uh, to, to deal with it. Uh, it continues here, every person in Ghana, whatever his race, place, or origin. So this is Article 12. This is one of the rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Let's read it. Every person in Ghana, whatever his race, place of origin, political opinion, color, religion, creed, or gender, shall be entitled to the fundamental human rights and freedoms of the individual contained in this chapter, but subject to respect for the rights and freedoms of others and for the public interest. So this is an interesting one. The proponents of LGBTQ uh, bill, the anti-LGBTQ bill, are going to rely on the public interest written here. It says that every person in Ghana shall have rights to enjoy his freedom, blah, blah, blah. And he must, have, he must know that he must have respect for the rights and freedoms of others. The anti-LGBTQ people, those who don't like the bill, are going to say that there's a rights and freedoms of others. The rights and freedom of others is the person's right to belong to any society. His right to belong to the LGBT society. His right to be gay or lesbian. His right to be that. They consider that as a right protected by the constitution. The other side is going to say that people must respect, in, in terms of their rights, they must respect the public interest. Those proposing the bill are going to say that Ghana is cultural and we don't like that. And therefore, the public interest is served if you are banning LGBT. Let's move on and see what's next. Article 17, it says... A person shall not be discriminated against on grounds of gender, race, color, ethnic origin, religion, creed, or social or economic status. A person shall not be discriminated against on grounds of gender, race, color, ethnic origin, uh, religion, creed, and social or economic status. Now, this does not include LGBT, does it? That's section 17. So the proponents of the bill are going to say that your article 17, it doesn't say LGBT because it lists a few things, gender, race, color, ethnic origin, religion, creed, or social or economic status. It doesn't say LGBT. So LGBT is not one of those rights captured under article 17. Before you say that, let's go to article 33. Slide. Okay, 33 is here. Now, it says... 
the 33 appears to be qualifying 17 isn't it it says the rights duties declarations and guarantees relating to the fundamental human rights and freedoms specifically mentioned in this chapter shall not be regarded as excluding others not specifically mentioned in which are considered to be inherent in a democracy so it says the rights that have been mentioned will not exclude those that have not been mentioned those rights that have not been mentioned that can be considered to be inherent in a democracy and intended to secure the freedom and dignity of man what is democracy where is democracy coming from democracy is coming from the united states of america that's where democracy is coming from so what is inherent in a democracy is it Ghanaian culture that's going to determine what's inherent in a democracy or is the american ethos of democracy that's going to determine what's inherent in a democracy so those who are saying that is the american ethos that's going to determine what's inherent in a democracy they will say democracy came from america and one of the fundamental ethos of american democracy is the freedoms the rights of people to exist how they want to exist the right of bobby risky to convert himself from a man to a woman that's his right they will say that's inherent in american democracy and you borrow democracy from america democracy is not your thing you borrowed it from america therefore you borrow the principle you borrow the concept and you borrow the ethos so they're going to suggest to you that when they talk about the things considered inherent in the democracy you cannot find that and locate that in ghanaian culture because democracy is not native to ghanaian culture democracy is a borrowed concept from the ghanaian people so if we're looking for things that are inherent in a democracy you go to the owners of democracy the united states of america if you go there would you find that lgbt has rights yes you will find lgbt has rights so this one is also going to go to the supreme court for a, a very interesting discussion these are these are the matters uh, that that look like is coming round. okay but let's look at article 39 as well it says cultural objectives so article 39 one subject to clause two of this article the state shall take steps to encourage the integration of appropriate customary values into the fabric of national life through formal and informal education and the conscious introduction of cultural dimensions to relevant aspects of national planning mm. that's complicated isn't it? that's deep so this is for the people who like the bill those who like the bill you're going to find in 39 says subject to clause 2 of this article the state shall the Ghanaian state shall take steps to encourage the integration that is why it says integration because the constitution recognizes that democracy is not of ghana article 39 is an admission that democracy is not of ghana so it is saying that you would have to integrate bring the ghanaian culture inside you have to integrate uh, the appropriate customary values into the fabric of national life through formal and informal education at and the conscious introduction of cultural dimensions that's what it means isn't it that's what it says so the people who like the bill can say that article 39 gives them full vigor to go after the bill and integrate the things of Ghanaian culture into the planning of the state. So you cannot talk about LGBT, you cannot interview Bob Risky. That's what is going to happen, isn't it? That's what is going to happen. And then the last one is here, 108. The 108 is about whether uh, the bill can charge on the consolidated fund, the point you made. The proponents of the bill are saying that there's a clause in here that we have, uh, we have not looked at. It's about the person presiding. It says the bill will proceed upon a bi the, the, the bill or the discussion will proceed upon a bill including an amendment to a bill that is in the opinion of the person presiding the speaker makes provision for any of the following so the speaker who is presiding must have looked at the bill and made and satisfied himself that it doesn't fight it doesn't fight with the consolidated fund or it doesn't fight with the provisions of the bill that says that only the president and the government can introduce a bill that charges on the consolidated fund so they are saying the speaker is the one presided he has made that decision and it's final and we move on so all of these things are going to be discussed for the next few weeks we're going to do a short discussion in the studio talking to our young people and find out where we are and uh, and what is happening let's get on to that now
Okay, welcome back, and uh, this is a, a, a roundtable discussion about uh, LGBT. Mikael, what, what, what did you find? What are, okay. How is the reaction? So, I was concerned with the international response to this. And I have to say that Ghana has enjoyed quite a bit of publicity. Perhaps maybe some would say it's negative. But uh, once you're looking at the way people were seeing this, I would say that perhaps almost evenly down the middle, there's positive and there's negative. As you do that, there's a very, very strong culture war going on in the United States, in the UK about... The American governments have said that we run the risk of economic difficulties. They have said that. Yeah. Uh, it's, and what again, does that mean? Is it difficulties? It means they're not going to give us money. So it's, it means a number of things. And I did see some people suggesting this when, for example, the BBC posted this story. So it means that potentially we could stop receiving aid from a state or a government perspective. From a civilian perspective, it might mean that private investors will say, I don't like what's happening in Ghana. Or maybe I'm a gay businessman. Are you going to arrest me the moment I, I arrive in Ghana to do business? So those are the two potential challenges. But I don't know if you watched the interview that um, Vladimir Putin, for example, conducted with Tucker Carlson. He was trying to make the case that, well, when you keep trying to sanction people, eventually you yourself will start to suffer because you're cutting yourself out from the rest of the world. So maybe, I don't know how this whole sanction thing will work, but now going back to the way people were receiving this, positively, the reason a lot of people were quite positive about this, I saw a number of people actually attempting or saying that uh, they would actually be happy to move to Ghana because these are Americans, really, saying this, very, very interesting. The cultural war, and before I even continue, I'll have to say that, this issue is so complicated and so controversial that you have to be very, very careful when you talk about it. Maybe it's not as developed the conversation in Ghana yet, so people don't get fired for saying certain things. But in other parts of the world, you have to be careful when you talk. Because the slightest thing, you offend a certain group of people and you're in trouble. So the reason a lot of people are happy about this kind of law being put out is because they feel that uh, historically, the LGBT community has been considered victims. They've been victimized. Gay people have been beaten up, lesbians killed, and so on. But now they feel that the tide has turned, and it has, it has gone from the LGBT community being bullied to them being bullies. Mm. So they feel, that, they feel that this situation has become such that now you can't even voice some kind of disagreements with some of the actions that are taken in favor of the LGBT community, some criticisms you might have of some members of the LGBT community, they feel as though this stuff is being forced on them. It's gone. Let's look them. at the influence of money. The, uh, people, the people who approved the bill mm -hmm. are angry with Afeni Makin and all the Utampa and for, forgive me, may he rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Minu and others yes. of the Gadget. When they said that oh, they want to take money from some people somewhere. Now, Tetra Minu is saying that. The people pushing the bill, they too, they've taken money because it's the same bill that is in Uganda, in European countries. It's the same bill going around the world and it's created by an American guy who lives in America who has met with all our people here. That's her allegation. That was the role of money in pushing this agenda. Oh, it's very, very important. So, I mean, you have to know, I'm sure I've recruited a sense. Is it true that there's money both ways? If there is money, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know, I can't say for a fact, but if there is money, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, in the United States, in the process of legislation, money is involved. They call it mm -hmm. lobbying. Mm -hmm. It's not anything to be ashamed of. Maybe when the public is properly educated on this, you know that money pushes legislation. Sometimes the legislation is good. Sometimes the legislation is bad. So nobody should say that money is a part of it, therefore some people are evil. Maybe the education should be done, but money is a part of legislation. You need money to make laws happen. You need a lot of, there's a lot of heavy logistical stuff that goes into it. You need money to make it happen. Mm. Constitutional uh, observers like me are, are very excited waiting for this test to appear before Parliament. And yesterday one lawyer was saying that if this goes to, uh, to appear before the courts, that if this, get, if this matter goes to the court, it will be bringing one of the major tests to the constitutionality, uh, to the constitution, and the role that Parliament can play in passing the laws, and whether the Supreme Court will hesitate to say Parliament has done something I don't want to go in, or they are going to say that this thing Parliament has done is unconstitutional. The more interesting part is the potential restraining order on the president. That are they going to the Supreme Court going to rule that yes, they have granted a restraining order on the president, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What do you think? And people say it's, it's, it's good at this time, and some people are. 
concerned that this is a time we should have had Justice Kula and Dimo Dibo, Kranis should have been there, mm-hmm. Kluje should have been there, Date Ban should have been there, Kofi Kumado should have been on the panel to look at this matter in, in, in detail for us. Well, how do you see, how do you see it going out in the, in the courts? Well, first and foremost, um, on the question of whether the Supreme Court or the judiciary should hesitate, this question has actually come up before in the mm-hmm. Constitutional Review Commission under Atta, um, Professor Atta Mills, mm-hmm. President, Atta Mills, former president of Ghana. And the Constitutional Review Commission actually recommended that instead of it being changed through an executive action, it should be submitted to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to make a determination to that effect. Now, the reason many people often would look at the Supreme Court of the 90s and the early 2000s is that... And be excited by it. And be excited by by the the bench then, um, Banfordado, Atuguba and co., it's as a result of the fact that at that time, our constitution was relatively younger and it was being tested. And when you, in human rights, we have journeys of rights. So you have the first generation rights and civil or political rights. Many of those things, you have the rights of association, MPP versus um, Attorney General Siba. You have your 31st December case and all of that. But as time goes on and when de- the democracies develop, when those things are settled, we then move to another realm of discussion of rights. So then you have things like feminism coming up. Mm. You have things like LGBTQ rights coming up. Second generation. So these are second generation. Mm. These are these are rights. Second that generation are, rights. Second generation rights. These are these are not what our, our, grand, our grandparents would have fought for. Would have done chobui chobui um, for. And so, well, when you when, when you say they are first world rights, what do you mean? Feminism is not, femi- feminism well, is for everybody. Say, feminism means what, by the way? The I fact that it, women should assert themselves. Well, not assert themselves per se, but women should equally be given an opportunity yes. to be at the table. Women mm-hmm. should go to school. Women should... There was a time... Yeah, but that's, was that's, not, that's not anything close to LGBT. No, I'm saying it's, a, it's generational. Mm-hmm. So, at, for instance, when they were fighting Rollins, uh-huh. these things <laughs> wouldn't have come up. No, we are fighting a military I mean, we're, we're fighting to have a constitution at exactly. all. Exactly. We're fighting for constitution. We're fighting for freedom of speech. We're fighting for freedom of association. It wasn't so much about the contents of the constitution, but just the constitution. Yes. That has ten limits. So now we've crossed that hurdle. Yeah. So this is a new so hurdle. We are, we are finding new rights. Exactly. This is a new hurdle. In fact, even environments, the, the right to enjoy clean air. As, in some places, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and yeah. it's now even coming up in, mm-hmm. in, in Ghana. You have cases like Center for Public Interest Law versus Tema Oil Refinery. So it is a generation, a generational um, a thing that's come. I think it's a good discussion because it gives institutions the opportunity to, the institutions we pay for, the opportunity to do their, the jobs we pay them for. And so what is the importance, what's the need of having a Supreme Court and giving judges salary is to, make determinations on these matters. Now, the, the, the problem I have with an attempt to place a restraining order on the president mm-hmm. would be that it purports to usurp the process, the, the process and the decision, the, the, the decision-making power given to the president in that instance. Because mm-hmm. the president can decide to say, okay, I don't want to send it back to parliament. I will not approve this. It is his right under the constitution, particularly in Article 107, to do so. 107, 106, 107, 108, to do so. If we go and place a restraining order on the president, it makes it difficult. But you see, the flip side of that is that in the constitution, generally, the judiciary doesn't or is not supposed to poke into the internal affairs of, 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 of other organs when those acts have not been done or have not been determined. So if it is a process, mm-hmm. you, you cannot just... So the president may it. go ahead to sign and then you can and go then to Supreme we say Court that and say... Based on this law... Based but on the but this of, parliament has passed it. So one part is concluded. Yes. So you can bring an action against parliament. But you see, the thing is that even though parliament has passed it, what parliament has passed has not been effectuated. It can only be effectuated when the president signs. So parliament has... Parliament has created the body. It is left for the president to breathe life into the body. If the body has not been... But if what is going before the president is illegal, or we Mm -hmm. suspect that what is going before the president is illegal, a restraining order surely should lie. You see, the thing is, Mm -hmm. for for matters of human rights, that would be so. That would be correct. That in in human rights... But there's a human rights application. Yeah, that's Article 33. No, this this application, when it goes before the Supreme Court, contains an essential human rights part. It contains. That's what I'm I'm, I'm coming to. That Mm -hmm. even though Article 33.1 says that, even if there is an intended or imminent breach of the Constitution concerning human rights, you can sue. Mm -hmm. 
And so, if you remember, Tyrone Iras Magai versus Board of Governors of Achimota School, mm-hmm. where Board of, uh, yeah, the Directors of Achimota, Governors of Achimota School, where Achimota alleged that it hadn't violated the boy's rights because it hadn't sacked the boy. It hadn't even taken the boy. It hadn't given admission to the, 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 the plaintiff yet. The court said that, no, so long as you are acting in a manner that looks as if you are going to, but you see, that's for human rights. You are going to touch his human rights. Yeah. Yes, but this equally is human rights. It's very human rights. It's very human rights, but it also goes to the root of constitutional processes. It does. So it is, it's, 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 yes, it's human rights, but it's also So you are, you are saying people may suggest that the Supreme Court should not be able to truncate a constitutional process outlined by the 1992 Constitution. Y- yes. They can it. say that the bill is illegal and it runs counter and it's inconsistent with the provisions of the 1992 Constitution. But they cannot stop the process when Parliament has passed is on its way to the president. So you are saying, surely we must allow, we have to allow the president to make a decision. Yes, if the he pres- decides to ascend the bill, let him ascend the bill. You can sue him after. If he decides yeah. not to ascend the bill, you can listen to his reasons, and the process can come back to Parliament. Yes. Yeah, so don't take that power from the president. But this is a highly charged political situation. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I, I so think maybe that's the why the president, being a chief politician. But you want to hear what the Supreme Court has to say. I even mean, think that's why this matter came up, if we are being very frank. I, I don't really think... the politics. Oh, yes, yeah, it's political. Let's be frank. Because it's election year. Of course, it's, it's, it's political. So if, if No, because if the president signs it, he's doomed. If the president doesn't sign it, he's, he's doomed. Yeah, yeah. So that's the point. It's, it's, so it's political. Box the, box the we are boxing the president into a corner. So some may but also be... president who's not running quick. for election. He wants to. He wants his party to to win. To, to win. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you, 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 he only wants your party to win. They say, <laughs> of course. So the, the the what they would also do is to try and then shift the burden or the responsibility to the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. After all, one, the Supreme Court doesn't really need our they're, approval to win. Nobody's voting. They are there. They are, they are neither so they retire. Or MPP. So they retire. Yeah. And so essentially, that is it. But the the true question we have to be looking at is. Whether or not the Constitution guarantees the rights of um, LGBTQ persons, and it's not just about the rights of LGB- uh, LGBTQ persons, which we often say LGBTQ rights, LGBTQ rights, but it is much more complex than that. If it was as basic as that, people would be getting a law school and passing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's more difficult. And the reason is things like the freedom of association comes in. Mm-hmm. Things like advocacy comes in. Advocacy is a big deal. That's what Rigade Post points. She yeah, says that criminal libel law has been uh, restored back in onto our books with this bill. That, that's what she's saying. Because you can't really... Things can be illegal, but people can advocate for things. So, for instance, attempted suicide till last year was illegal. If you attempt to kill yourself, you'll be punished. You'll be sent to prison. Mm-hmm. But people advocated, people advocated, and last year it was changed. Mm-hmm. And so I think... So you should allow be... the advocacy. Yeah, there should Eventually, be... it may win, or it may people not win. Or is it? Is this such an above... above, above abominable act mm-hmm. that we don't want it to win. But you see, the thing is, who determines what is abominable? I am sure in your constitutional law class, upon reading the constitutional history of Ghana, you observe that there was a time where the support for Kwame Nkrumah was high, such that mm-hmm. people could easily say, well, this is a man that says that he's going to sack judges, but we still like him. Let's vote for him. At that time, and, and you would wonder, ah, what was going through the minds of our grandparents to vote for such a policy? But they voted they, for it. They they gave the circumstance of the time. Yes, that's why we should be careful the power we give to politicians to do what politicians can do with the power we give to them. Mm. Because you may have a crop of politicians today saying A. Tomorrow you may have a crop of politicians saying something else. Okay, so how do you see this going forward? What's going f- we, should going look, f- we should wait for to see who, go to, who goes to court and, and, how, to they court go to and court. how the outcome is. But we equally should be careful what we put in materials for educational purposes of children. Because Sam George says that um, his, initially he really, he really didn't care what people did in their bedroom. But upon hearing that yeah, the advocacy they put a in school the, the curriculum. In, yeah, attempts put in curriculum um, children of um, seven, eight, nine years um, old were being introduced to, to, to certain things. He was alarmed, and rightly so. And so okay. there should be a, a, a balance, and the Supreme Court should be charged with the responsibility to come out with, with a decision. Miguel, is it important to young people on social media? I would say, that? because we are... We, they know, they care. Care. People know. People care. We are the ones going to inherit the world as it is. So I would, I would imagine that 
and I have seen the conversation. Well, what is the view of young people who are between 21 and 26? Do they think that, you know, let's get on with it? Uh, so typically, it's, it's very, a very popular narrative that young people are liberal. As they get older, they become more conservative. So I said, now, typically a lot of people are liberal about it. But when you are forward thinking, you would recognize that I should look at this a bit more closely. And on this issue that the point Africa was making on how we should regulate what we allow politicians to do. A lot of people are in favor of this bill because it is on Christian lines, it's cultural, it's moral. But we are looking at the processes being used. Are they foolproof? Are they legally airtight? Because we don't want a situation where 20 years from now, this same legally questionable approach is come and remove there. the bill and, and create yes, something yes, else yes. for us. Okay, that's our short conversation. We're going to go on to be talking about this for a while. Uh, we're going to link now to social media. Are we going to get any text messages on this one? I'm sure they are. Uh, let, let's see. Janet starts with a laughing emoji saying, Mr. Miss Bobrisky, hey, Mr. Paul, you will kill a person. No, I love this show. Keep up the good work. God bless you. Coming from Quiz Media Pod, he says, they must respect our culture and traditions which frown upon LGBT. Again, from Quiz Media Pod, he says, democracy comes with responsibility. Coming from Augustin Asari Donko, he says, what will happen to the young men who are on TikTok portraying women character? Are they promoting transgender or just acting? Lastly, from Charm William Benjamin, he says, we live to see how things go. Would you yes. So Kwame Sakonzi Paul, could this, could do, could those for the Enlightenment on the anti-gay bill vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution much as democracy is not of Africa for that matter, Ghana, I think we have domesticated our democracy to suit our society. I loved when the constitution spoke of integration or foreign rules of life and our culture and our way of life. Paul, I don't think we should entertain such useless acts in our society. I think that's a little bit harsh. Now, Kofi Bailey says, good evening, Paul. Anti-LGBTQ is not good at all. All what it means is undermining blessings of God in themselves. Now, in comparing American democracy to Ghanaian democracy, Stephen Rico says, does America support polygamy? Why are, we now ask, why are they now asking us to accept their homosexuality? Stephen Rico says, the president must not refuse to sign this bill. I would like to see Vice President Baumia's presidency and I don't want the president to make things difficult for him. And lastly, Dada Akwesi AJ. He says, Paul, I don't get what Mr. Apriko Ejapon is saying. Is he comparing this bill to the fight for democracy? I do not see any human right thing in this bill. I think this will be addressed the next time we have such conversation. And lastly, Stephen Rekul says the NPP risks losing this year's election if the president refuses to sign this bill. I have a soft spot for them, but I will openly campaign against them. Angelo. Okay. Our friend Master Plata says uh, the next state of the nation's address will be read by Dr. Bamiya in 2025 as Ghana's president, inshallah. Thank you, but I would have wished you would have also commented on the discussion we just had. Uh, and on the topic, Hamdan Chabob says, uh, Senior Paul Adam Autry, if I can remember the definition of democracy during my JHS and the SHS, it refers to government of the people, by the people and for the people. So either it is a borrowed governance system or not, the people of Ghana, in fact, majority of people have decided on the said subject. Okay. Now, with this being the last message from us, this also would be everything from us. A good evening, Ghana, from the technical crew and everyone else. Have a good evening.